Check. 1927, Iowa City. It's going back time. What do you remember when you were a little kid? I don't remember too much about uh, <laughs> we had moved to Fort Dodge, Iowa. Uh, I didn't know what the, the depression was, but I remember uh, this was a town of about 29, 30,000, and uh, there were approximately 85% vacancies in the downtown area. Uh, my dad was working for, my dad and all my uncles were working for a chain store group of women's readywear stores. And uh, I remember my mother worked at the store also to help him. And on Saturdays, I would uh, come to the store and then they'd drop me over to the library and I'd pick up about five to six books, go back to the store and I'd read for a couple of hours and then they would uh, send me down to one of the theaters where they had two features and five cereals for like 20 cents and a uh, bag of popcorn was a nickel. Yeah, I'd spend the early evening there and then I'd come back to the store and uh, there were quite a few Jewish families in this small town, about 45 families. Well, and, in uh, Fort Dodge. Yes. Uh -huh. And uh, after this, the stores would stay open until the last, cust the last farmer left. And um, then about uh, a dozen or so of the Jewish families, they'd get together and they'd go to one restaurant and they'd eat dinner late, like 9.30 in the evening, 10 o'clock. Anyway, uh, uh, we... You know, growing up in the Depression, we didn't know uh, not to have something. You, you uh, played with a piece of chalk, marbles, uh, whatever. It was, a, it was a different thing. We didn't have television. We didn't have uh, uh, all the things the kids have now, the, uh, the computers, the tablets and all. Right. So when you, when you moved to Fort Dodge, was it because the Depression hit your family? and No. My father was with this chain store, and he was transferred to... Transferred, Fort. okay. Yes. Okay. And we lived there for about 11 or 12 years. Uh, I th think I went from kindergarten through the sixth grade, and at that time, he bought his own store, and uh, three or four of my uncles, they all had gone in business for themselves, and they helped each other. That was the... I think the family way then uh, you would help someone get started and uh, we uh, we went back to Iowa City and we lived there for quite a few years and uh, he had lost a lease on a store and then bought one in Alton, Illinois where I went to high school and I was one of five Jewish kids in the whole high school. Wow. Uh, Happened to be pretty active, uh, played a couple of years of basketball on the team, but uh, uh, you sort of mailed in. Were you, were you excited about that or was that a tough move for that you? That was a tough move, yeah, yeah, because as a kid you get sort of grounded, you have friends right. that uh, you've made and uh, you're happy and here you got to pull up roots and I guess it's similar to uh, someone who's been working with IBM, uh, it's like I've been moved and uh, <laughs> Every few years, you pull up roots. Yeah. But um, uh, coming out of the depression, uh, everyone ended up having their own business then. Right. Now, talk to me. Do you remember your grandparents at all? Yes, quite vividly. Um, my uh, maternal grandfather and grandmother, I believe, were from Lithuania, Vilna. Right. And um, uh, sorry to say, my grand maternal grandfather was sort of a miserable human being. <laughs> he was suffering from uh, rheumatism or arthritis and uh, never was a happy person. Right. We would come down to St. Louis to visit during the summer and uh, uh, I can remember he uh, always was telling my dad how to correct me or mm -hmm. punish me. Uh, my uh, grandmother on my uh, dad's, my dad's uh, mother, she was from Austria and she married a gentleman by the name of Jacob Greenberg and um, I don't know where he was from, I presume Austria also. They had three children, my dad Lou, uh, a brother Harry and a sister Ida and for many many years, well first of all, 
they lost their dad, I guess when my dad was about six or seven. And for many years, uh, we thought she remarried another man by the name of Greenberg. All the cousins had told me I was one of the youngest of the group. So when Carol and I were married, we went up to St. Louis to visit the family, and we're having lunch one day at my aunt's house. And out of clear blue, I make this statement, how unusual it is for a woman to marry two men by the name of Greenberg. And she looked at me as if I was out of my gourd, and she said, where did you get that idea? And I said, well, all the cousins had told me that that's the way it was. And she said, no. She met this man by the name of Abraham Krupnik, and she said, I've got three kids. You want to marry me, you change your name to Greenberg. Oh. And he did. <laughs> wow. So wow. anyway, uh, they had good for her. They raised the three kids, but they also had one after that. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, there's another story that goes along with it. My dad uh, was living in Longview, Texas, when he was eight years of age, and uh, we never knew why. Well, a uh, I guess you'd call it a short tail relative put together a history. Uh, my grandmother's maiden name was Wasserkrug. And uh, he did a history of the Wasserkrugs Ross going back to the early 1800s. Mm -hmm. Seemed that she had a brother that lived in Longview, and when she lost her first husband, she moved to Longview to be close to a member of the family. But she did end up going back to St. Louis, and uh, as a after she lost her second husband, she did have three furniture stores which she ran. She was quite an enterprising, powerful woman. Wow, that is, that is amazing. Did your grandparents, did you ever hear why they came to the United States? Um, get away from the uh, oppression in Europe. Uh, Vilna was not the greatest thing in, place in the world to live. And uh, I think Austria was very uh, Germanic at the time. Um, they, uh, they ended up coming in through New York, Ellis Island, as right. so many. But uh, St. Louis was one of the major stopping off places. And they both, en both grandparents ended up there. Uh, a very interesting thing took place at our wedding. Uh, Carol's aunt, the oldest one, Celia, and my dad sit down together and they discovered they were in kindergarten at the Jefferson School in St. Louis when they were five years of age. They had never seen each other since, since then. That's, a, that's amazing. Now you say St. Louis was a major drop-off point. Yes. Why, why was that with New York, Chicago? I mean, how did St. Louis get into that picture? Uh, I don't know. It was a, a mercantile center at the time, I think. Um, I don't know why, but uh, it, just it became was. a center, yes. Well, after, after high school, um, did you go to college then? Yes, I returned to the University of Iowa at Iowa City and uh, attended the university. Uh, interesting thing, when uh, I left school, I uh, I did three years there, then I did a year at Washington U in St. Louis in the School right. of Retailing. Then I went into Korea and I came here uh, for a cousin's wedding. I had an aunt living here and I said, I just don't want to go back living a hundred miles south of the Minnesota border or uh, the cold states. Well, it was like a, a, a whole Iowa group moved here. There was a Dr. Coleman Jacobson, I was a fraternity brother of, Mel Kadesky, um, Will Friedman, Herbie Holland. Uh, there were a whole bunch of us that were fraternity brothers, and we ended up here. What, what year was this that you graduated? Uh, 1950. Did you go to work, or did you go into the service? 1950 to 53, I was in service. Okay. I was stationed in Camp Gordon, Georgia. Uh, three months I went to school at Fort Ben Harrison in Indianapolis and back to the same office in uh, uh, Camp Gordon. Uh, I happened to have been one of the early ones to go in. I think Korea broke out in July and I went in in December. I was uh, pre-inducted uh, shores of uh, Fort Sheridan, Illinois in December. <laughs> It was freezing cold, and uh, there was an office clerk. He was wearing both a Jewish star and a Christopher medal, and he was interviewing me. And I said, 
I don't understand this. And he said, well, my parents were Christians and they were killed in an automobile accident and a Jewish family raised me. So we got acquainted and he said, uh, where would you like to go for basic training? I said, anywhere south. Don't send me right, right. anywhere north. So I ended up in Georgia, thanks to him. Wow, interesting. Now, did you ever have to go to Korea? No, I never got out of the state of Georgia. Okay, so what, what were they training you for anything specific? Uh, when I first went in, and after basic training, I was in a uh, radio uh, communication outfit called an Amtrak 5, where the radio is on the back of a, like a half-track truck. Well, we had uh, gotten our notice that we were going to Korea. I came down with something, and I went to the infirmary, and they gave me a penicillin shot. I broke out from my chin to my ankles like I had the measles. And I went in the infirmary for like four or five days, and the outfit went up to Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, special training, and then overseas. I never, they never shipped me back to it. Oh, wow. So yeah. penicillin, you had a reaction to penicillin. Yes. And that kept you out of Korea. Hmm. Now, the war comes to an end. Do you leave the service? Uh, I was discharged uh, in 53. And I went back to Iowa, and uh, I told my family I didn't want to stay here any longer. And uh, as I had come to Dallas and liked it very much, I drove down here about two or three times. And finally, the uh, family said, well, why don't you get a job? And uh, we don't want to stay up here either. We're going to start looking for a lo business location in Dallas. So I went to work for Neiman's. And, um, that was an interesting thing. Uh, I was in the junior executive program, but I was selling shoes at the same women's shoes. And uh, I came from a state where it was pretty well integrated at the time. Not integrated, but not as bad as Dallas. I was there about three, four weeks, and a black lady comes in. She wants to try on a pair of shoes. And I bring them out, and the manager of the department says, you have to take her in the back in the stock room. You can't show her shoes on the floor. Right. And I was, I would say I was in shock. I didn't know whether I'd drop the shoes and walk out or just comply with it, which I did. But, uh, How did it make you feel? Miserable. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm miserable the, for her. Uh, did she say anything to you? No. At that time, um, nothing had taken place in Mississippi as far as the mm -hmm. race deal uh, was concerned, but uh, I felt miserable. I felt like I was the lowest human being on earth. When do you think it started getting better in Dallas? Well, I think after the, um, the Little Rock incident, I think that uh, once things uh, transpired well, the Mississippi incidents that took place. Um, I remember that they didn't even have kin kindergarten in the schools here when I moved here. And I thought, gee, how far behind when my dad was 79 when he moved here and he'd gone to kindergarten in St. Louis, the school system was really a mess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm hasn't improved a lot as far as the, the Dallas Independent School System is concerned. Hmm. Um, when you met Carol now, tell me about that meeting. Well, that was interesting. Um, I had a cousin, we were very close, about he was nine months younger, and we palled around together. And through him, when I moved here, I met quite a few friends. I, I was networking, and uh, there were approximately eight to ten of us that decided one evening we didn't have any place to go for New Year's. And one of the gentlemen uh, had a listing on a house and it had about six bedrooms in it and it was a huge place and been on the market for a year and a half and no one had been interested in. So he volunteered the house and each one took a different thing. Someone took care of the catering, someone took... And uh, I was the one that was elected to do get the entertainment. And um, we interviewed several groups, and there was a uh, quartet, a group, trio, quartet, whatever. 
uh, that came down from the uh, University of North Texas. And uh, we listened to them and they said, gee, they're really good. And uh, we said, well, what's the price for New Year's Eve? And they said $100. So we hired them and that was Trini Lopez and mm -hmm. his group. And it was a fantastic evening. Um, Carol was with another gentleman that evening and uh, he lost out. <laughs> <laughs> now, were you still working for Neiman's at the time? Um, no. My family had moved down here and we opened up a store in Pre what's known as Preston Center. Mm -hmm. It was a uh, company that uh, we specialized in clothing for large women, mm -hmm. what they call large and half size. There was uh, one competitor here in town and after approximately 18 years they wanted to buy us out. So we sold out at that time. and. Um, we had not really taken a real vacation in quite a while, so we had uh, the three kids and we went to Hawaii, and when I came back I went to work for her family. Uh, her dad and mom wanted to travel a lot and they needed another person in there, so I worked there for 32 years. Mm -hmm. And what was that company? It was known as Charles Curtin Company. Uh, they made home furnishings. We uh, we made about uh, 800 uh, bedspreads a day, 1,400 per drapes a day, and um, I retired approximately 15 years ago. Uh, I retired from there. I've done several different things mm -hmm. since then. Approximately 2008, 2009, uh, China just put them out of business. Uh, we were, I say we, they were getting uh, finished unfinished goods from the Far East and uh, Turkey and finally China started going directly to the stores we were selling, the chain stores. Mm -hmm. How have you seen the Jewish community change over the years in Dallas? Uh, I've seen it grow immensely. Uh, our temple, when I came here, had two rabbis, uh, Rabbi Levi Olin, who was a, a tower, and Gerald Klein. Now they have six rabbis. Uh, the uh, membership is probably a little more than it was at that time. I think there's 2,800 families, but there have been a multitude of uh, different uh, congregations spring up around us. Some of the rabbis are uh, into various different uh, civic things. Uh, Olin was on the Board of Regents of the University of Texas, uh, very highly respected. I think, uh, I think we have some rabbis in the community that are in that same category. Now, in your lifetime, there's been so many momentous occasions, of course, you know, you lived through World War II, you were in the service during the uh, Korean War, uh, Kennedy assassination here in Dallas, the moon landing in 69, of course, 9-11. Is there something that really stood out that affected you? I remember as a kid, I had an infection. Uh, I had a strep throat, and the only thing they had to give me was a sulfa drug. Mm -hmm. And I look back at the advances in science, but I say, I say, wow, what the computer, what the the semiconductor, the the whole high tech world has done for us. It's been amazing. Yeah, we lived through a pretty good time this generation. We've seen a lot of change from. Uh, is there one invention that you thought was the best one that you've seen because you've, you've lived through such progress? Right, like the computer alone has, yeah. has been uh, met, what it's done for the medical profession, what it's done for everything. It's Now you have three kids and seven grandkids. What advice does Grandpa have for those kids? Go out in the yard, lay down, look at the sun, enjoy life. but. And everything you do, do the very best you can. Then you'll have no regrets. Expose yourself to everything and anything that you may have been interested in. Jack, you did a great job. Thank you. Thanks for doing this today. <laughs>